got uh, uh, Ralf Wagner here from Frank Frankfurt, Frankfurt in Germany. He's a uh, world-renowned endoscopic spine surgeon uh, and a uh, great speaker and a uh, great surgeon. Thank you for being here. You're going to talk to us the basics of endoscopy. And he's going to be on Saturday in the lab yeah. together with Dr. Alowitz, who's sitting over there. Well, good morning. Thanks, Roger. Thanks, Luis, who's still in the air, I guess, uh, for the invitation. It's a great honor. Um, just one question to start with. Who has experience with endoscopic surgery? Just raise their hands. All right. So we saw from the, um, from the talks of Avellino that uh, the smaller the tube gets, the less, uh, the less problems we have with uh, postoperative uh, care. And the further development is to make it even more smaller than the smallest tube. This is my disclosure. So that was a patient I did uh, about four weeks ago, and you see the difference. Um, it was a recurrent disc herniation, the difference in the approach and in the muscle, uh, as well as in the scar tissue. When we look um, in the history of endoscopy, we actually have the first tries uh, even as early as 55. And um, of course, the development of the technical tools of the cameras, of the optics, uh, uh, pushed further and further. So in 88, uh, Camben uh, was the first to describe the anatomy of the Camben triangle, and he did some percutaneous uh, discectomies. We have uh, Tony Young here in the States, who uh, was a pioneer uh, with the so-called um, inside-out technique here with one of his first endoscope, uh, the YES uh, endoscope. We have Thomas Hockland, who already deceased, but um, he was uh, um, a big fan of doing a foraminoplasty and combining then uh, the decompression of discectomy uh, with the scope, and he used some special bone drills. In terms of approaches, uh, we saw um, that the microscope has a coaxial light and a light beam. And uh, the, the endoscope has even a, a, an advantage over that because it actually stays focused in about five, five centimeters, three to five centimeters from the tip of the scope. It has a steady irrigation and it gives you the possibility to look around the corners even if you don't have a big, um, a big approach. Now, uh, the intervertebral foramen, especially for the uh, transforaminal surgery, is an important issue. You see that the nerve root normally comes out on the top um, of, um, of the uh, neuroforamen, but um, you have to pay attention to take a close look to the sagittal fuse of the foraminal area because sometimes um, you have um, some nerve root um, pathology or low uh, descending nerve root. We have changes when it comes to uh, neuroforaminal uh, stenosis or central stenosis, and you see on the right picture that there's actually a folding of hypertrophic yellow ligament. Sometimes this folding can calcify um, in combination with osteophytes and uh, posterior ligament calcification. It might uh, make the surgery uh, a lot more difficult here. You see, for example, um, the, the same issue when you have a neuroforaminal stenosis, how the folding of the yellow ligament, the telescope phenomena of the facet joint uh, might alternate the, um, exiting, uh, the exiting nerve root. And in those cases, you have to um, also uh, do some bony resection to restore the normal anatomy. When you take a look in the um, lumbar spine, you see that the foraminal area gets bigger the higher you get on the lumbar spine. This puts the focus, especially if we see that the interlaminal window is the biggest in L5-S1, this puts the focus on L5-S1. So in those uh, L5-S1 levels, um, it might be a, a big advantage uh, to go uh, from an interlaminal um, uh, approach. Where do we use the endoscope? Um, we actually use it in all different areas of the spine, from the front and from the back, from the side. Um, mostly uh, in cervical uh, spine, we have the anterior and the posterior approach. Anterior is more common in uh, Korea or the Asian room, Asian um, uh, area, uh, where you go through the disc. Um, there's some critic about it, not, but um, it's a good technique. We can use it in an um, extra plural um, way on, on the thoracal spine, and we can use it uh, in the lumbar spine. An important thing is that we find uh, a common uh, nomenclature for that, uh, because when you look in literature, you can read about percutaneous disc, um, uh, transforaminal disc, whatever, different techniques and different, um, different um, words to describe it. I think it's important not only um, that we all talk about the same problems, but also in, uh, when it comes to discuss um, the remuneration um, or the money issue with, uh, uh, with, with the social security or the insurance companies. 
Basically, when we look uh, in lumbar spine, we have two different approaches. We have the interlaminar approach and uh, the transforaminal approach. Um, both um, have uh, different uh, good and bad um, about it. But for all of those techniques, we need an X-ray. And of course, the smaller the incision gets, the more you have to pay attention that you don't accept um, uh, problems in the X-ray. So you have to be centered. You have to have a good view on the interlaminar window. And I always uh, try to correct the table before I um, correct uh, the angulation of the X-ray, which makes it a little bit more easier uh, to manipulate. We have the scope, the tower of the scope, and uh, most towers have a, um, have a screen. They have a camera, um, a, a, a camera part, a, a pump, um, some, um, some machine for putting your endoscopic burr in, and uh, the bipolar. And um, then you can have, of course, um, some, some recording system. But basically, um, um, you can put uh, the technique on, on existing towers um, uh, from other companies. And we have different scopes. Uh, the scopes have um, differences in angulation, in size, in length, um, and also um, um, in, in indication. So the bigger the scope, uh, the more you can decompress, the smaller the scope you uh, might be able to move uh, inside the spinal canal. Basically, the front of a scope is always uh, constructed in a similar way. We have a working area, a working tube where we put our instruments in. We have a optics um, where the camera, where the light and the camera cable comes in, and we have an irrigation channel, one or two. That depends um, on the company uh, you're using. Um, actually, a 30-degree angulation is mostly common in between 25 to 30 degrees angulation when you come in a transforaminal way because that's about the angulation you take uh, to approach it. And uh, the more you have to work straight, like in interlaminar decompression, it might be a 15 degree angulation. Then we have different tools um, for the approach. We can start with the needle, with the Jamshini needle. We have dilators, we have working channels with different uh, design. Uh, that depends uh, what kind of retraction you want to achieve or where you work. Um, and we have uh, different burrs, um, from diamond burr to rosen burr, flexible, non-flexible burr, forceps. Um, so there's a big variety in, and, uh, in, in all those instruments. And every instrument has a certain uh, application in the spinal canal. We have um, side-cutting bone drills, which are blunt in the front, um, but it might be helpful to open up the foramen area. And once we are inside, um, we have also possibilities to actually see uh, what we're doing um, and use the, the diamond bird, like you see it here in different, um, in different um, spaces of the spine. Then we have uh, different positions, prone and side position. Um, when you do uh, the patient in the side position, you have to take into account that you work towards you. So the sides are changing. So the right side is the left side. It's uh, comparable to a, um, to a children's helicopter, which flies uh, towards you. We have um, different uh, indications uh, for uh, interlaminar and transforaminal surgery, which depend on uh, where you work in the spinal canal. And of course, we have different trajectories. So um, all those things you have to put together to um, to plan the right access for the right indication. Then when we take a look into literature, we see that there's um, a difference um, in the approach. Uh, so not only the angulation, but also the position of your pathology defines where you have to, uh, where have to come in. And uh, this is, for example, a normal approach with the foraminotomy uh, in a craniocardial direction. So you see you can actually reach cranial sequestrated disc herniations. Or this is an intradiscal approach. Um, um, when you have a contained disc. And the main thing is that you're orientated and you know how to stop and when to stop the surgery. You can combine it um, with fusion technologies, as you see it here, um, the interoperative view on a, a titanium printed uh, cage. Uh, after the surgery, you can then control uh, the amount of decompression, your exiting nerve root, um, and that the cage is positioned correctly. Now we have um, um, different sizes. Um, basically, the big sized endoscope stays in the uh, above the lamina area. The smaller the scope is, the more you can move inside. Um, in the interlaminar technique, we have to think about the pathology. Is it in the axilla, uh, axilla or is it on the shoulder? Because that defines where you come in and where you um, try to put uh, the first uh, steps of your surgery. And similar to the tubular technique, we have a unilateral, bilateral decompression with undercutting. And you see it on the picture 
that actually uh, the contralateral decompression allows you uh, to see um, um, and to work more obliquely on the facet joint. Here, for example, is a um, ipsilateral decompression of the lateral recess, um, followed with a um, stepwise uh, decompression with the carison uh, punch. So the picture is very nice uh, due to that uh, irrigation. Then opening of the yellow ligament, defining uh, the lateral edge of the traversing nerve root. In the middle, you see the disc. Um, on the left side is cranial, on the uh, right side is caudal. Um, and you can do the um, contralateral decompression, as you see it here, um, working uh, on the contralateral recess and the same thing um, after the release um, of the traversing nerve root. We can use it for thoracal discs, um, just to jump over it because I'm a little bit um, out of time already. Placement of the scope um, and a postoperative uh, picture after decompression, you see the blue color. That's due to um, a stained uh, contrast uh, dye, um, so you, you actually can differentiate the tissue better, and you see the postoperative MRI shows a complete release. We have the anterior and posterior cervical approaches. Basically, um, the anterior approach is the percutaneous technique where you mobilize uh, um, the esophagus and the carotid. You put in the scope, which looks a little bit different, and you can actually see some of the structures. So in the middle, you see the, uh, the anterior part of your facet joint with the exiting nerve root after the release. And uh, we can perform the same thing as a posterior foramen to me, as you see it here, with a good view on the, um, on, on the released exiting nerve root, which um, is in the picture, points towards six o'clock. So um, all together, I think the endoscopy is far more uh, than a, a disc procedure. It's advancing in a very high speed. Um, uh, the application is now um, also for degenerative disease and with the new te uh, te technical development of navigation um, robotics, um, as well as expandable cages, I think it will soon come uh, into the uh, fusion market, uh, especially the cervical, uh, the revision cases and the fusion cases might be the uh, techniques of the future. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any questions from the audience? Um, yes, please, in the back. No, I took your mic. Just tell us, or tell us again your name and where you're from, just in the beginning. So, we'll, sorry, we become uh, Jason, a big group after a while, and then everybody knows each other, and we okay. don't have to do that anymore. Sorry, um, Jason Perrin from Mannheim, Germany. So, right, right, right next to you. <laughs> um, when you have the continuous irrigation, how is your management for CSF leakage, or if you have a dural tear on the endoscopic surgery, or, or what is your rate? Well, well? That, that's a good question. I, I'm when it happens. And the rate is, of course, when you start to do the surgery and you start to apply it on degenerative disease might be higher than, uh, well, it's the same tubular technique wherever you start something. Um, I would say one out of 10 CFS leakages you have to revise and you have to open up. It's not a problem if you do an interlaminar surgery because you can actually widen it up. The patient is positioned on the same side and you, uh, you suture it. Um, and transforaminal uh, technique is, um, the problem is that it's located on the anterior part. So what I do in those cases is I actually come from the back, revise it from the back and then um, make a, um, a patch with fat, uh, with fat and, and collagen. Um, but I'm, I'm, um, I'm impressed by myself that actually even if you have a leakage where you see some of the uh, small fascicles floating when you put something uh, on it, um, there's almost no no problem of there's I, I've never seen a problem of uh, um, of wound healing due to CSF leakages. Most of the revision are done because of the clinical symptoms, like they have some motoric deficit or some some other problems. But for the moment, we don't have. Um, there might be a chance in the future because with a bipolar a biportal uh, endoscopy to suture it, or with new developments. Um, I heard that the, um, that, that the Dura seal might be an option. The problem is always that you have a lot of irrigation fluid, then you have to kind of make, make the whole uh, operation feel dry and then put it on. Now, um, the, the last case, or one of the last cases, the cervical foramen, are you going contralateral? No, I'm going uh, ipsilateral. Ipsilateral. Now, I was wondering how many here in the audience have uh, experience with endoscopic spinal surgery? 
how many here have, have done endoscopic? So maybe 10, I would think 10. How many of you uh, who've done it think that it's pretty straightforward learning curve? No, nobody. So I have one question. Who thinks he's smarter than I am? <laughs> so it's easy. If not, I couldn't have learned it. I think the most important thing is that you stick with the technique and that you try to do it continuously. Um, I compared with a PlayStation. So I have a small son. I played with him PlayStation. For three years ago, it was no problem. Now I play PlayStation with him, I, I lose every game. It's actually um, the only thing you have to do is cases and stick with the technique. Um, and, then, uh, and then it opens up by itself. And then what about, you know, obviously courses, right? So, uh, yeah. sim is any good simulation? Anything there, you can well, do you other have than cadaver? the realist spine, um, which has has a possibility to train it. You have some uh, dry uh, labs where you can actually um, uh, use the endoscope to do that. Um, there is now a small uh, toy box where, uh, with a three D printed uh, thing where you can actually train it. You have the cadaver labs. Where do you get that? Um, soon available. Oh. Yes. I'm Edson, I'm from Lisbon Medical School. I've learned endoscopy surgery with Ralph, as, as long as Sergio also. And I can say that it's a very, it's, it's a very steep long learning curve for a person that starts doing endoscopic. I think the interlaminary approach is quite straightforward because it's like a tubular, but in a smaller incision. The transfer aminal, it's much difficult. And that's the, the like Ralph said, you cannot give up because the transfer aminal, it's not that anatomically speaking, we're not used to this. So uh, it's its a steep learning curve. But the, inter the interlaminar, it's not that tough. Let, let me ask you the first, and I'm all for learning. I think the best learning tool is Rolf because he's yeah. going to come to your hospital and he's going to do yeah. the cases That's for you. That's my business model, you. Roger. That's my business <laughs> model. Yeah. So keep that. But uh, I mean, uh, and, and uh, you know, w w how often do you, Initially, I think you have to be prepared to convert to tubular. Have you done that in your personal learning initially? We never done that. We never converted. We never converted to tubular, but it's easy to give up. It's easy to give up because, like I said, the first, first, second, third time you do a transfer amylar approach, you take quite a long way. It's it's a very difficult to understand the anatomy, and. Normally, a case that will take you in an open surgery or in a tubular surgery, 45 minutes, it takes you probably two hours to do it. So that, I think that's, that's the, the main thing. Another comment in the that's back. Sorry, Ronzi. I'm Bala Purushottman from the United Kingdom. Uh, so is this the only technique you use, or are there any cases where you're not able to use the endoscope and use the tubes? Um, uh, also a very good question. So my, I, I was trained with a very minimal invasive guy whose name is Jürgen Harms, yeah. you know, yeah. who would do a fusion for recurrent disc herniation even in a 25-year-old patient. Um, so for me, it was a complete change of philosophy. Now, um, I, I do every decompressive surgery with the scope first. If I have a complication, luckily it's rare, I, um, I open it up. Um, I do not do microsurgical decompression um, only um, on the spine anymore in primary cases. So, um, what I, but I do normal surgery like disc arthroplasty or a fusion or whatever. But uh, for decompression, um, I use the scope. What about multi-level lumbar stenosis? Same thing, I got faster. So we had the same question two years ago. So um, all, the, all those indication and technical steps you know from Roger Hartle's talk, they, they can be uh, exactly uh, copied for the endoscopic surgery because the tubular surgery is actually nothing, uh, that, nothing more than a, a bigger tube with microscope. It's the same thing as a smaller tube with endoscope. So you have the same principles. The only advantage is that we don't have to flip the table. We just turn the scope by 180 degrees, and we can look around the corner with the loss of the three di third dimension because we're, we're working on the screen. So you have to have the haptic feedback uh, with your instrument. But it's um, uh, for the uh, interlaminar uh, decompression, it's the same principle from indication to technique, as you know, from tubular surgery. Uh, we we got to move on, but we're very quick. Gianluca Vadala from Rome. It's a, I would like to know what is about the fibrosis when you have to revise a case where you have been 
that we, we have done endoscopically. So what about the amount of fibrosis compared to a, a tubular and open surgery? Well, um, we have to differentiate in between interlaminal and transferaminal. Um, um, interlaminal, most, of The interlaminal cases, um, you have a smaller area where you worked at, so you have a smaller amount of fibrosis, but you still have the, the same problem as in open surgery. What you can do, actually, is you can just split the yellow ligament and get disc herniations out without uh, resecting it. Um, but the same principle, if you do a revision, um, you have to stay on the area around that fibrosis. Even if you do revision on a microsurgical case, um, you have to stay in virgin area and then uh, move yourself from there towards the, the, um, uh, the scar tissue. If not, you can get lost and uh, have higher complications. All right, thank, thank you. you.